WWJB bracelet. Uh, everyone gets one for free today. This is just a fun thing since we're doing Super Bowl and Valentine's. I thought we'd do a giveaway. It's going to tie into the sermon. But it's mostly fun. It's a throwback to, uh, to my childhood, being a teenager in the 90s. So some of y'all's kids might have, uh, might have gone through the WWJD phase. Um, if you missed one, grab one. You want to take one to a loved one? We got a couple extras. Uh, that's what's up with that. Y'all know it's Super Bowl today. We've got the Super Bowl going on. Uh, last I saw it was pretty tied up, so I don't think we have an official ruling. We'll have an official ruling for you next week on who won the Super Bowl, the one that matters. <laughs> um, and uh, we also, speaking of next week, on Saturday, are going to go see the dinosaurs. Um, we're going to the Dino Park, where they make concrete kind of reconstructions of uh, dinosaurs. That's this Saturday. If you want to join us, uh, come and join us. Julie Arredondo is the party planning uh, <laughs> we have extraordinaire. We in the back. <laughs> the, the person who has detailed answers to questions, I can say that I'm going, but if you ask him, like, what parking lot or something, Julie, Julie's going to be the, um, the go-to for that. Um, any other, oh, I also want to let you know, we had a brief conversation in session last week. Um, if you ever are inclined to come early, you are welcome to, and I mean, I get here between 8 and 8.30 every morning, so around 9.30, um, I'll be available to just spend some time in prayer for St. John's and St. John's mission in, in the world and in Christ. So, if you want to spend that time in prayer with me, you might be the only one. Nobody was here this week. But, you know, uh, you can bring seven friends and then there'll be eight of us. Or nine of us, because you have seven friends and me. Um, that, that's just an open invitation, and I want to extend it. Uh, any other announcements I'm forgetting? we got a Mary Carrie in the back. Quick worship committee meeting after. <clears throat> yes, of course. <laughs> Just making sure we got our, our I's dotted and our T's crossed regarding Lent and Easter. Believe it or not, it is time to be thinking about Easter um, and Holy Week and those kind of things. So we're going to make sure we got all our plans right. Julie. And I just wanted to announce we're transitioning <clears throat> from the Super Bowl to the mission of the month of Monastery Cristo. They do um, mm -hmm. for, um, dental um, work for, for people who can't afford it. Great. And other things. Um, I believe David has volunteered in advance to call us to worship. So let us respond to the call to worship as David reads it for us. <clears throat> Psalms 51, 1 to 4, and 10 to 4. Have mercy on me, O God, the thorn she is dead, there is love. The thorn she is dead, there is love. Not out of mercy, not out of my transgressions. Wash me through you from your iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that so you are justified in your sins, and blameless in your past judgment. Clean in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And restore me to the joy of your salvation, and sustain me in the living spirit. Amen. We're going to sing it three times. It's a very short hymn, and it is a uh, it's a version of that prayer I mentioned last week. Come, Holy Spirit. So let's invite the Spirit into this place.
confession with the words of 1 John 1, 9, but our song this week is especially uh, relevant to a call to confession as well. The Lord knows our transgressions, and our sin is ever before God. And so let us confess. <clears throat> Using, uh, yeah, gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. Grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the life of the Lord.
let's, uh, let's pray, shall we? Let's, uh, let's join together in prayer, sharing the body's joys and concerns, the things on your hearts, the things on your mind. What are we praying for today, St. John's? Go ahead, David. Uh, part of this, uh, John Snyder, he's a co-worker, but he's to work with the city. His wife called me uh, Friday. He's in the hospital. In, he's in hospice. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been in and out. He has cancer. Since he's been in the hospital from January. Ooh. So uh, she just let him know that he's in hospice. And it's just a matter of time. Okay. Same with John. Yeah. It can be hard sometimes to know what to pray when someone's in hospice. Yeah. Right? There's I'll, a sense I'll, of I've known him peace. Since. Peace is a good word for it. Yeah. I've known him since. <clears throat> yeah. Here's another one. I'm sorry. A former principal at Beach Elementary is on hospice as well. Mm -hmm. Amber Golden. Yeah. So for it, 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 her. Him. Him. So yeah, for him and for his family as they're beginning the grief process before the departure.
under the, the thing in front of you. It's just good to read it on paper. It helps you get more familiar with the Bible. It helps you connect what you're hearing with what you're seeing. And we're starting at 12. <clears throat> then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes! Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and of nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. He left them and went out to the city of Bethany and spent the night there. In the morning, when he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the side of the road, he went to it and found nothing at all on it but leaves. Then he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they were amazed, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to the mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. Whatever you ask in prayer with faith, you will receive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> So my, my operating theory, based on my experience in ministry, is that a lot of us come to a discussion about prayer with a certain theology, mostly that we've inherited from childhood, that whether, like, like we know this image is distasteful, and we would say no to this image, but we don't really know what to replace it with. We kind of think that prayer is like a... Uh, a magic lamp that, that God is like a genie and prayer is like rubbing the lamp and and that you gotta rub the lamp hard enough and long enough and right and then the genie pops out and you get what you want and we're like well, that can't be right but then we don't really know what is right we say it's not exactly like that but kind of is right and I'm, I'm trying to work to expose you to enough of the biblical pericopes, the biblical narratives about prayer, to shake some of that up and to say, man, these passages are kind of weak, aren't they? Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. How do we do that? If prayer is what I do when I'm on my knees, then how do I do that without ceasing? Right? How, how do I, I, I've got to get off my knees sometimes. There's other things God has commanded me to do. How do I not forsake the fellowship of believers and also never stop praying? If prayer is something I do with my hands folded and my eyes closed. By the way, again, I'm not saying it's bad to fold your hands and close your eyes. I think that can be a very helpful thing. But I have looked into it to try to figure out where that started. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, you have to fold your hands and close your eyes to pray. In fact, when Jesus prays, it says he lifts his eyes up. Um, and in, in the ancient church, when they depict people praying, they never depict them folding their hands. They depict them doing this. They make this little W, which is called the Oran's position. Um, and that's what we, we thought prayer looked like, like the first, second, third century. As far as I can tell, the folding hands came when we started gathering children together for Sunday school. And, you know, you would say, okay, we're all going to pray right now. And little Billy is sitting there, and he immediately pokes the person next to him 
and then we get all disrupted. And so we learn to say, all right, kids, we're going to pray, so fold your hands and close your eyes. We're going to focus. And you know what? We're all still kids in a lot of ways, and sometimes it can help to focus, to fold our hands. But that's a, yeah, this is what I'm talking about, right? Like, these traditions, these, these things that we learn culturally that are useful have become all mangled with our understanding of what prayer could be. Now, my suggestion to you, my, my kind of two cents that I want to drop in your piggy bag, if we can get those last couple of verses back up on the screen, Jesus says, uh, uh, Jesus answered them, 21, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to the mountain, be thrown into the sea, it will be done. Whatever you ask for in prayer, with faith, you will receive. So the key word to me in that, like the, the word that's going to change our interpretation of that passage, is faith. What is faith? Or sometimes that, that word in other translations, and yet the New International Version, is the most popular translation, that word's going to be believe. Same Greek word, pistis. If we interpret that to mean that if you, if you think real hard, right, if you, if you um, really have a lot of faith and, and loyalty to the concept that uh, the genie will grant your wish, then your wish will be granted. Right? If you, if you have a lot of belief in the fact that your prayer is going to work, then God will do your will, if that's what faith means. And I think that's the normal thing to interpret. That's what a lot of people, that's what even a lot of preachers think is going on. And then the takeaway, which isn't a terrible takeaway, is like, shame on us, we don't have enough faith. But I want to drop this possibility. What if faith means... Faith in God. Faith in God's will and loyalty to God's mission and God's desire in the world. Right? Then what this becomes, this Greek word pistis, is truly I tell you, if you are following God and are not straying from God, if you're if God is, is guiding you and directing you in what you are praying for. Not only will you do what's been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to the mountain, be lifted up into the sea. And because God has directed you to say to the mountain, be lifted up into the sea, because God wants that mountain gone, then it will be done. Whatever you ask for in prayer, in obedience to God, you will receive. It's not that God does whatever you tell him to do. It's that if you do whatever God tells you to, then you're going to see this kind of stuff. If you do what Jesus would do. That's our, our kind of tie-in. These, these bracelets, like I said, these were huge in the 90s. These were, when, if you were in youth group as a kid, um, it, it, there was this big movement, this, this what would Jesus do movement that asked us, um, you know, the, first of all, you wear the bracelet, and then you hope that one of your friends at school will ask you why you're wearing the bracelet when you have an opportunity to share the gospel with them, right? Because that's never happened to me. <laughs> I don't think that that, ever, that that happens very often in terms of opportunities to share the gospel. But that's what we imagined, was like, oh yeah, my fashion accessories are going to be my, my foot in the door <laughs> to get me to share the gospel. But it was also supposed to be a reminder um, to, you know, if your hand is reaching out for something sinful, oh, what would Jesus do? Let me know. Unfortunately, and, and it's, it's fun, it's harmless, I like the bracelets, um, but it's, it's actually a very radical thing. And I think a lot of the radicalness of it got lost in the fact. The question, what would Jesus do, originates from a book called In His Steps. The understanding of that book was that if we're following God, if we're faithful to God, right? 
Faith means not only think it's true, but, but live as if true. We can uh, go to the next slide. That would be a little distracting. Um, and it used to be that the rabbis in ancient times, the, the literal goal was if you were a follower of a rabbi, if you were a disciple of a rabbi, and the rabbi like, walks to the market to buy fish, you want to take like the same footsteps as the rabbi. You want to do like the best compliment for uh, a disciple in the ancient world was to say you are covered in the dust of your rabbi because you're just following right behind him so closely that just every time he takes a step, that dust gets on you. And that's how we should be as Christians. As we should be followers of Jesus, doing exactly what Jesus would do in every circumstance. One of the really radical examples in the book was uh, a person who got called in uh, for the draft, World War II. Um, and, you know, he, he, he went to the, whatever, the Red Draft office or whatever and said, hey, I just, um, you know, I'm here to report for the draft, but I just want it on the record that I'm, I'm a Christian. Like, I'm literally a Christian, like a follower of Jesus. I want to I be in the steps of Jesus. And they're like, well, yeah, we've got lots of Christians here, right? I mean, are you saying you're a conscientious objector? Are you like a Mennonite? And he's like, well, no, it's not that I'm a conscientious objector per se. Um, it's just that, you know, what are you going to have me do in the war effort? He's like, well, we're, we're recruiting bombers. And he says, okay, um, here's the thing. As a follower of Jesus, um, you give me directives on, on, you know, bombing a particular target. Before I drop the bombs, I'm going to have to pray and ask whether Jesus would bomb those people. Is that okay with you? And you know, there was this silence in the drive up. Like, you can't do that. There's a chain of command. There's a, well, I, I'm not going to do that. My chain of command is straight to Christ. It's, it's an extreme thing. Like, it's, it's not a good way to fight a war. And, and World War II is a big deal. You know, we're fighting Nazis. There's an important moral effort going on. But, but the statement, what would Jesus do? I mean, it's not a matter of don't reach out for that underage drinking 90s teenager. It's, it's really a matter of how many aspects of my life, how many ways, how many choices that I make could be more in line with God's mission, with God's purpose, with God's will for the world. And if that's what prayer is, if, if prayer is me constantly checking in with God, saying, God, am I asking for this in faith? God, what, what are you asking for in this situation? God, what do you want me to do? God, how do I follow you? I want to pray in faith, and I want to trust that, God, if you want a mountain move, it's going to move. <clears throat> well, then I can do that without ceasing, can't I? I mean, more and more. That can be the goal. That I am, that I am constantly faithful. That I am constantly following God. It's not just the things that I ask for. It's not even just the things that God asks for. It's not, it's not all requests. It's an ongoing conversation that goes backwards and forwards and, and sometimes in no particular direction. Sometimes prayer can be silence. Sometimes prayer is asking God for things. Sometimes it's God asking you for things. Sometimes it's listening to God. Sometimes it's just being with God. And I want to take you back. <clears throat> I want to take you back to my motive, my goal, my reason for talking to you a bit about this. We're trying to grow this church. And specifically, I want to encourage you to pray for a specific thing that I believe God wants. I believe that, that it is a faithful prayer, that it is something God wants for you to pray for two or more people who are not in your family, who don't know Jesus, to come to know Jesus. For, for two or more people that you know who aren't going to church, again, we don't need to play games with the who's saved, who's not, that's God's business, but like, two or more people who need to come to church, that they would come to church. And you can pray for your family too, but I'm talking about the two besides your family, besides you and yours. And if... Prayer is like a genie in a lamp. What we're going to do is we're going to pray two or three times, 
and we're not going to get our wish, and then we're going to say a prayer doesn't work. And we might not ever admit that out loud. We might not say that to our pastor, but we're going to quietly in our heart of hearts kind of come to believe, yeah, prayer, the genie, the genie's broken. I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm not faithful enough, maybe I'm not holy enough, but I just don't buy that, and we're going to stop doing it. We're not going to make it a daily practice. But if prayer can be an ongoing conversation, and if we can be content to say, God, I just want to let you know that I care about these people. And I want to know your will for these people. And, and I want people, well, often what's going to happen is God's going to change us, right? God's going to say, you want those people to come to church? Invite them, right? But, but we're not ready to invite them. We don't know if we're, that's scary. Okay, just pray for it. God will get you ready to invite them. Or maybe God will do a miracle and get somebody else ready to invite them. We know that God desires God's children to know him. And so we want to pray for God's children. And we know that God has put us in the lives of people that he loves for a reason. So I want to encourage you to pray for two or more people. And I want you to do it every day. And we're going to keep talking about prayer and we're going to keep building this layer cake. And as we do it, our understanding of prayer is going to be deepened, and it's going to be widened, and it's going to become easier. But as I said two weeks ago, it's like a diet. You can learn all sorts of stuff about dieting, but you also have to do it. So start to pray. Start to discipline yourself. If you already pray every day, pray more. And, and pray, pray for more of the things maybe that, that God wants, for whatever way that you think God is calling you to deepen your prayer life. Take another step. And together as a church, as we become more and more in praying the church, miracles are going to happen. Mountains are going to move. I am confident. It says so here. Amen? Amen. It's not on the screen this time. We can, we can do it anyway. Amen. Amen. All right. We have got... Uh, no? Yeah, we've got a creed. Let's confess what we know to be true. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. The Apostles' Creed was written in Greek as well. Remember that word believe. It's the same word as faith, just a different part of speech. I have faith in one Lord. I believe in God. You believe in God. Not just think God is true. Not just think God exists. But really trust and desire to follow God. In, in that uh, that line of thinking. Let's sing together, Here I Am, Lord, dedicating ourselves to the mission and the work of God.
if we understand that that passage in Matthew 12 where Jesus does all kind of, kind of weird things, you know, cleansing the temple, making people mad, being kind of smart at it, and then uh, saying, hey, if you pray in faith and not doubt, meaning if you really think that what you ask for is going to come true, then you're going to get whatever you want, then that doesn't hold true. That becomes a contradiction with reality. It suffers from a reality problem. I know him. But if we interpret faith to mean following God and say, hey, if you ask for the things God wants, you're going to get the things you asked for. Not the things you want, but the things God wants. And you can learn to want the things God wants. Then it becomes the opposite of contradiction. It becomes what's called a tautology. It becomes true by definition. Right? Of course. Yeah, you pray for the things that are going to happen, then those things are going to happen. Jesus loves tautologies. One of his favorite, or one of our favorite tautologies of Jesus is the tree and the fruit. He says, hey, if it's a good tree, it's going to bear good fruit. If you think you got a good tree to bear a bad fruit, God news, that's a bad tree. You got a bad tree that starts bearing good fruit, it's not a bad tree. You know how I know? Because it's got good fruit. Good fruit, good tree. That's how it works. So the same. If you pray faithfully for the things God wants, then God's going to want those things. Here's some things I believe God wants. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve each other, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.